president and CEO of the American Public Power Association, and I'd like to welcome you to Public Power Conversations. Natural gas is a critical resource for generating electricity that serves millions of public power customers. It's also the cleanest burning fossil fuel. But extreme weather coupled with rising prices can threaten the reliability and affordability of electric services that people have come to expect. Here to discuss some of the recent developments in the natural gas world and how they affect public power are Kevin Gaydon, President and CEO of the Illinois Municipal Electric Agency, which, serve, which provides power to 32 public power utilities in Illinois, and Dave Osborne, General Manager of the Oklahoma Municipal Power Authority, which, similar to IMEA, serves 42 communities in Oklahoma, but two in Arkansas and one in Texas as well. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Thanks, Thanks pleasure. All right, well, I have some questions to guide the conversation, but we're free to wander off wherever the conversation takes us, but only within the 15 minute time frame <laughs> that has been designated to us. So let's dive in, gentlemen. Um, so let's start with the big picture, which is how important is natural gas to public power and electricity generation in your communities? And, and for this one, we'll start with Kevin. Well, thanks, Joy. Um, in the upper Midwest, uh, natural gas generation is not as prolific as it is, as it is in many other areas of the country. Uh, natural gas is primarily the fuel of choice for, uh, for heating, but as the coal units and the nuclear units in this region continue to retire and renewables increase, there's likely going to be more uh, reliable reliance on that natural gas as a bridge fuel to ensure long-term reliability. Uh, you're probably aware we also run a small wholesale natural gas joint action agency, so we're keeping track of the prices on a very regular basis. The concern we would have in this region, as natural gas gets more and more of a, an essential fuel, uh, the, during Storm Uri and other similar events, we saw significant uh, operational flow orders and maximum flow capabilities on pretty much all the pipes in this region. So as you continue to add natural gas generation to the fleet, that's going to put more and more pressure on those pipelines that are already there. And uh, especially during that winter season, when that natural gas heating is really high usage. And then, of course, we'll be dependent upon that during that same period of time. So concerns about that in the long term uh, to double up on some of the pipe sizes we've got in this region anyway. Thanks for that, Kevin. That's, that's very helpful in kind of setting some context here. Um, what about you, Dave? Yeah, Joy, uh, you know, natural gas is extremely important to uh, the OMPA and OMPA member communities. Uh, gas makes up approximately 60% of our generating capacity on a nameplate basis. And in any given day, we can be generating anywhere from 50 to 70% of our energy from natural gas. So it is, it is extremely important. And in 2021, the total energy we produced was about 42% came from natural gas. So it, it, it is obviously critical to uh, us. And the costs, therefore, have a, have a huge impact. Uh, as when gas prices were low for so long, we enjoyed very low energy costs. Uh, as things have changed in the last year, uh, it is generally reflected in much higher energy costs. Throughout our region, you know, the Southwest Power Pool that we operated in uh, is very fortunate to have a lot of natural gas. But with the prices high, uh, the price of energy in, in these RTO markets, at least in our market, in SPP, is almost in lockstep with gas prices. So even though we have a lot of wind, you know, very uh, dominant with wind energy, gas still sets the price in the market. So we're seeing much higher elevated prices uh, for energy right now. That's a really important um, component, too, in terms of that, that gas as a price setter. Um, and I, and I think this leads to the next question, perhaps that we'll just stay, stay with you, Dave on, um, can you describe the economic impacts on your organizations and their customers from the high natural gas prices during winter storm Uri in February of 2021? Sure. Yeah. I wish I could say, I'd be happy to share that with you, but it brings back a little PTSD, uh, you know, through that event, but, uh, you know, it was a huge impact. For OMPA, the impact uh, in URI was around about $64 million. And to put that in some perspective, 
for that six-day period of high gas prices, we paid more for gas in that six days than we did the three previous years combined. So you, you can just get a sense of, of you know, the impact it had. Uh, we were fortunate through the work of my finance team and some external financial advisors, we found a way to you know, mitigate those costs our member cities are still going to be paying for it, but instead of a price increase, basically they're going to defer savings they would have had in the future. So we did some financing, short-term financing, did some bond refinancing, took advantage of you know lower interest rates in the bond markets. Uh, but in the future years, they would have saw a decrease. Now they're not. They're going to be paying for it in future years. But again, we're very happy, and they were very happy. We didn't have to pass a you know mid-year uh, price hike back to them, but. They're paying for it either way. You know, they're, they're still going to be paying for it. Well, and, and I'll turn to Kevin in just a second. But what, what that also kind of, you, you all managed beautifully in terms of what you could do and sort of the controls you could put in place, you know, as that crisis was happening and then subsequently. Um, but as you said, there is a still a cost impact of, uh, that is extended out longer while we're also seeing the need for um, more investment in our communities because of sort of the clean energy transition and also needs from customers. So there's this need for investment while at the same time there's this price this price pressure that the natural gas um, price spikes during year put on you as an agency. So um, so that that is a, a challenge that's sort of maybe ongoing for you all. Um, so I don't know if right. you wanted to react to that. Yeah, let me follow up a little bit on it. You know, the one thing I didn't mention is, is that, you know, we we did use a substantial amount of cash reserves that we had. You know, we were fortunate our boards over the years have built up rate stabilization funds like a lot of, you know, agencies and municipalities have. So we had to draw down on some of those cash reserves. Well, what that does is that we're going to defer some capital improvements we would have liked to have made in some of our plants. So, you know, it, it, it comes at a cost and it, it defers other major maintenance or major capital improvements we would have probably been doing this year. So it, it, it has an impact. Absolutely. Well, so, so Kevin, you want to add your experiences with regard to your specifically um, up in Illinois? Yeah, we, uh, we saw some very extreme weather conditions, um, you know, much colder than they saw down south. But much of our uh, operations and enterprises are, are very well winterized, so we're able to avoid some of the outages. But we did see some very high power prices during that period of time. For the most part, our power resources did very well during that point in time. There was a short period of time we saw uh, $1,500 per megawatt hour power, nowhere near the 5000 to 9000 they saw down in Texas. Um, but on the on our natural gas side, about a third of our gas customers saw some of this uh, price escalation depending on what pipeline they were on. Uh, we saw prices go from uh, first of the month of about $3 a decatherm. Some of our folks paid $230 a decatherm. We've heard uh, it, through the Central Plains as much as $600, and some of the folks in Oklahoma and Texas, $1,000 or $1,200 a decatherm. Uh, if you think about $230, that alone is about 80 times what that first of the month price was uh, from, from the, for the month of February. So Five of our members saw their all-time highest natural gas cost to supply their customers. Um, they've been in the business for a very long time, so did have some uh, impacts on both the reliability in the electric region here and had some pretty, uh, pretty uh, tight stresses on the natural gas delivery system throughout the entire upper Midwest. That's, that puts it in perspective, too. Even though you all weren't seeing the, the extreme, it's still that the swath of the impact, right, all the way up. Um, up the chain uh, of the middle of the country. It's important to, for people to understand because people don't always think about Illinois have, having been impacted as greatly as it really was. Um, so switching gears now to, to this year, in February of this year, in February of 2022, APPA called for a, we called for a CFTC, which is the Commodities Futures Trading uh, Commission, uh, which governs sort of the, the futures prices of natural gas, we called for an investigation by that agency into a natural gas futures price spike just this past January, January of 20, 2022, so a full year after URI. So, you know, how did these 
maybe smaller but still significant kinds of market fluctuations impact your operations and what, what can be done, if anything? Dave, why don't you go first again on this one? Sure, thank you. This particular issue, a particular item, if you want to say for that day, that did not impact us at that day because of the way we were currently buying gas. But, however, saying that, it can have a significant impact. Two reasons. One, sometimes utilities contract for physical delivery of gas for the month, you know, the prompt month, month coming up, and it can be indexed off of a particular day. So if you're buying gas and you're, you're going to agree to pay it, whatever that price is on that day, that one day spike can cost you millions of dollars, which I know it did for some particular utilities. The other way it has impacted us in the past, again, not for that particular day, is for our uh, hedging. So we, we hedge gas for years, and it's just a financial hedge. It's not a physical hedge. But again, you base what you pay on a particular day. Ours sometimes is the uh, first of the month price. In this particular case, I think maybe it was the end of the month price. So we didn't have a hedge on that particular day, so it didn't hit us, but it just as well could have. And, you know, that's not, it's not the intent, right? For public power, what we're trying to do is establish boundaries. We're trying to say, okay, we, we're willing to pay a little bit of a premium through a hedge to avoid uh, larger cost increases. We're not out playing the market. And, you know, those types of things need to be looked at because they can have a real impact on a uh, municipal entities or a public power entities uh, price with that, you know, when that happens. So it's, it's a big deal. I can remember several years ago when we got hit with a one day price spike of $13 and we, it took us, you know, we had to spread that over several months to recoup that from our cities for a one day price spike. Of course, back now, thirteen dollars looks like cheap compared to Yuri. But the point is, these one-day price or two-day price spikes really need to be looked at to see what's going on because they have huge impacts, bottom line, to public power. Well, and Dave, um, you know, we don't know yet whether the CFTC will investigate. I believe they try to keep that kind of private, um, but we're hopeful that that investigation will occur. And, and of course, once. If it does occur, once the results are released publicly, we will, we will certainly inform our public power members about that. So Kevin, what about you? Do you want to talk, to speak to this question or um, or do we move to the next one? Yeah, no, so similar to Dave, we, we, we do use uh, gas hedging uh, pr uh, procedures to be able to optimize our gas costs delivered. Uh, we do use some limited amount of call options uh, in that marketplace for the, some of those derivatives, uh, but typically we're locking in physical gas for those deliveries for future periods. Um, even now, some of those longer term strips uh, look more attractive than the near term things are, but you really got to make those decisions further out into the future. Um, as we saw those prices spike up, uh, for us, one of the other things we, we work on very hard is to make sure our energy scheduling is as optimized as possible so that we're not over scheduling too much or under scheduling too much, because if you miss that schedule, you know, on a traditional uh, April day or May day, it usually doesn't have as big of a cost impact. We're seeing that very significantly right now. The day ahead price in the power market might be $100 per megawatt hour, but the real time might shoot up to $600. And if you're short, you got to pay that difference. So those are some things that need to be uh, kept in mind. I think one of the other things besides the CFTC investigation, I know one of the things that they're discussing is this $25 million limit for small users uh, hedging threshold. And, uh, you know, when you're talking natural gas being uh, $3 a decatherm, and then it goes to $8 a decatherm, pretty soon, uh, you know, the ability to hedge some of those things gets pretty muted uh, when, the, when the cost of the commodity goes up by over 200%, and, the, and that threshold doesn't, isn't allowed to go up enough. Um, it, it really doesn't uh, give you a lot of choices in that, uh, trying to hedge that underneath that $25 million limit. That's something that uh, we think needs to continue to be investigated as well. Thanks for that, Kevin. Appreciate that nuance there. Um, so this next one, we'll start with you this time. Um, earlier this month, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator, or MISO, released the results of its annual planning resource auction and found that there are some serious issues with capacity shortfalls. So what's going on there um, from your perspective and, and what can be done? 
Well, for those that are not paying very close attention to this marketplace that has been accustomed to, it was a real shock to see the capacity market go from $5 per megawatt day to cost of new entry, which is $236 per megawatt day. But for those of us that have been uh, entrenched in the MISO uh, area, uh, the auction really verified what most people have known here, is that as those aging thermal assets continue to retire faster than the renewables are put in place, uh, that accredited value that we're required to keep from that uh, capacity uh, continues to shrink over time. And some of that has to do with the thermal resources generally get accredited for their name plate ratings less their forced outages. So if you have a forced outage rate of, say, 10%, you can get, generally get 90% accreditation for that capacity. With the renewables, uh, currently wind gets 15%, uh, solar gets 50%. Uh, there's some discussion in MISO about going to a seasonal construct where that would reduce the amount of nameplate, uh, the, uh, reduce the amount of capacity accreditation uh, in some cases in the, in the solar case to go from 50% to 5 to 10% in the winter season. So instead of having to replace two to six times the amount of capacity from a nameplate standpoint, it could be 10 to 20 times the amount of nameplate uh, that you'd have to put in and so most people say, you removed 100 megawatts over here, how come you can't just put 100 megawatts of renewables in there and have the same accreditation? Well, that's not how the system works. Um, that's not the requirements that we have in the, in the RTOs. Um, so as many, of, as many of us know, many states have continued to expand the renewable and carbon-free goals. Um, these states have determined that a certain percentage of their thresholds uh, will come from renewable those are decided by the states and not by the RTOs or by FERC. And as, so as some of the folks in the north and the central part of MISO have done and expanded those goals, including my state of Illinois, we must also be mindful that this transition takes time. And just because we want it to happen quickly doesn't necessarily make it happen more quickly. Now, there's a number of things that uh, have caused that de those delays and some of that bounciness to happen. Uh, some of it has to do with um, we're all aware of the the planning cues in the RTOs are really backed up right now. Uh, we serve in PJM and MISO, and both of them are backed up quite a bit. There's also some uh, supply chain issues that are being ver fairly well documented, as well as a recent Department of Commerce investigation regarding solar panels. So much of this is outside the control of the developers and the utilities, but once the clock starts ticking, uh, things have to continue to move on. Uh, in order to have a safe transition, uh, we feel like we need to continue to take measured steps um, so that we can ensure that there, there's a reliable set of resources already in place before we, before we uh, allow those uh, retiring generators to shut down. And again, uh, many folks take reliability for granted, um, but if, as we've seen over the last couple of years, uh, reliability is not something that just happens by accident. It takes a considerable amount of work by a lot of people to make it happen. Absolutely. Amen on that one. Um, well, so Dave, since you're in Southwest Power Pool, I don't know if you want to comment on any resource planning allocation issues there. If we want to just move on to the last question, I'll leave it to you. Well, I will just add on a little bit. So we don't have a capacity market, thank goodness, down here. But what's happened because of URI is there is a lot of work under underway right now in Southwest Power Pool to change the capacity accreditation process. So it's similar to what Kevin was saying. Uh, you're going to see tariff changes coming through that's going to base the capacity. Instead of just you know running for two hours on a hot summer day to show you can run, they're going to factor in all your forced outages, your D rates. Uh, so uh, they do expect there's going to be a fair amount of capacity accreditation lost, if you will, once they start factoring that in. And they are going to start probably going move into a seasonal capacity requirement where you're going to have a summer and a winter. So... We all see that come in. We're all following the tariff discussions and, and see where it goes. But, you know, it, there's a lot of fallout from URI besides prices and capacity accreditation is one of them that we're seeing down here in this region. Appreciate that perspective from, from the SPP region as well. Um, so my last question and uh, is, is, I think, an important one that we should touch on, which is in recent comments to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commissioner, FERC, on natural gas infrastructure, APPA, we acknowledge the vital role of natural gas as utilities evolve their resource mixes to lower emissions. 
But from your perspective, what steps does FERC need to take to ensure that natural gas remains available and affordable for public power and our customers? So Dave, do you want to kick us off on this one? Sure, I'll try. And you know, I thought about this one because, as we know, FERC doesn't always have the authority to do certain things. So I think that's the other thing is maybe the question of what does Congress need to be doing? But we know what that is like. So, you know, the, uh, you know, I think one of the things I thought of is availability to pipelines, you know, pipeline access, getting pipelines built. We're very fortunate down here in Oklahoma is the, we have an abundance of pipelines, right? Because we're very uh, strong in oil and gas, but that's not true in other parts of the country. So those other parts of the country where they need access to the gas, I think FERC really needs to look at trying to get these pipelines built, getting permitted and, and make it available. Uh, the other thing is storage. You know, one of the things that we have learned with the markets and now with URI is the value of gas storage. And we have a couple of gas plants that just don't have access to storage. The pipelines just don't have storage available on it. And I, I would love to see more emphasis placed on uh, storage availability on the pipelines because uh, that can be a valuable tool uh, with that. And then the last thing, you know, is what's the key word nowadays? Resilience. Resilience, resilience. And we learned through URI that, you know, we're in Oklahoma, we're huge fans of the oil and gas industry. It's a valuable part of our, our, our economy. But what Yuri showed is that there is a vulnerability there. And we need to figure out how to address, you know, the, uh, the vulnerability to freeze ups on gas production and transportation. So I think that's an area they need to look at to see what they can do to try to try to make sure that it's going to be there when we need it. Absolutely. Great point. Um, I'll just I'll just say on the storage side, when APPA we did a, a paper you know, 12 years ago about about this and storage is naturally occurring. Um, although I know that there is some sort of on-site storage capacity that can be created, although it's more expensive. Um, but I think there is maybe some evolution in terms of being able to have sort of man-made man-made storage capability. But typically, you know, the storage sites for natural gas have been natural. And so it's really, you're limited to where those natural kind of caverns are for storage. Um, and I think that's been a factor to your point in terms of, of how, how flexible the system is. Mm -hmm. um, so Kevin, you want to take us home here on this question and then we will wrap up. Yeah, thanks, Joy. Let me, let me start with the availability part first. Um, we think that FERC and the states need to be thinking about not only the gas facilities, but also the power facilities that are needed to help find and deliver gas need to follow those FERC and NERC recommendations for winterization. Um, it's been pretty well documented that, gee, about every 10 years something major happens in the south that if we would have winterized that equipment down there, uh, a number of those things might not have happened. And so you might say, well, what does winterizing something in Texas or Oklahoma mean to Illinois, but much of the gas that is used in this part of the country comes out of those sections, which has caused uh, those issues that I that I highlighted before. So those winter those events do happen in Texas. They'll likely continue to happen in Texas, and so it's something that uh, we should uh, uh, consider as an essential commodity, and truly should really treat those uh, facilities similar to the way you'd treat a fire station or a hospital, because it really is an essential part of the grid. Uh, that needs to continue to stay there as we saw those cascading effects from what happened down in Texas. From an affordability side, and this may be a little fairly technically detailed here, but we all know that FERC tightly regulates the electric power supply markets uh, in the RTOs using the market monitors. Uh, every hour that we dispatch into the RTO, we have to submit what our cost is, um, and we submit that documentation every hour and be able to prove that. But Considering that the natural gas as a fuel can change very rapidly uh, in a very short period of time from a no notice or a, uh, over a weekend like we saw last year, um, if that fuel gets really volatile and, those, uh, and you're needing to run that through the generators, um, it's very difficult for the market monitor to say, you used to charge $25 and now you're charging $125. What happened? And it's because the fuel, the fuel stock that went through of which that market monitor has no regulatory oversight on, uh, it gets pretty muted pretty quickly. Uh, in fact, during Storm Uri, um, it, for our area of the country, we saw no physical curtailments 
from any operational flow orders, yet that commodity that had already been produced was stored in the ground or a pipeline for less than $4 a decatherm was costing somewhere around a thousand, you know, $200 to $1,000 a decatherm for something that was eminently storable. So I do think there, there do, does need to be some additional research there. Uh, considering that, um, that the essential nature of this fuel going forward, some oversight by some regulatory uh, body at a federal le level needs to oversee that. Dave, I think, alluded to it earlier. Since these things are interstate pipelines, et cetera, no one state's going to have the jurisdiction of telling the other states the way this is going to be. So it really does have to come out of the federal level. Uh, but as we've talked about uh, in FERC and all the other uh, national regulatory uh, groups that are out there, it's really like a hot skillet. Nobody's very interested in touching at this point in time because of the potential politics that spin off of that each time it happens. So concerned about availability and reliability. And as we put more and more eggs in this one basket, it's going to get more volatile as time goes on as opposed to less volatile. So many things to be concerned about. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, it's and and you know, I think one of the things we can do in the short term in the short term is doing this type of education, not just of our members, but of policymakers. And and so you all have articulated these things very well. Um, and and we've gone a little bit longer than our 15 minute limit, but I think it was a really important conversation. And um, we will, you know, encourage our policymaker brethren to listen to the, this conversation and, and to others like it and uh, continue to work with uh, champions in Congress on this important issue as well as the agencies and, and shining a light on this, which we do so well in public power, making things transparent and shining a light. So thank you all again um, for this conversation around this extremely important topic um, and look forward to seeing you all soon at our national conference. Uh, and uh, with that, thank you again.